All right, and we are off here. So thank you everybody so much for being here. Welcome to another episode of Birds and Bites, the virtual program series from Chicago Ornithological Society. I'm super excited to have you guys uh, join us this evening for a special screening of the film, The Magic Stump, as well as a director Q&A afterwards with uh, Chicago's own Bob Dolgan. Um, so I will hand thing, you know, we're all here to see the film. We're excited to get going here. I don't want your popcorn to get cold. So I'll just do go through a real quick, um, just, you know, notes about this screening. We are recording this. Um, the film itself will not be recorded. We will be uh, obviously not posting that online, but any of our discussion period in time will be recorded and we will be posting that online at a later time. Um, please note that while we are watching the film, please stay muted. Obviously, we don't want anybody all of a sudden interrupting a cool scene, dramatic scene with a falcon with the sound of a dishwasher in the background. Um, so please remain muted for the duration of the film. Uh, at the end, we will have a time to Q&A with Bob. We'll get things started with a few kind of starter questions, but then we will open up to you, the audience, to ask your questions of uh, our guests here today. Please also note that this is part of our ongoing series, Birds and Bites, uh, that features a variety of different topics, speakers, events, uh, and activities. So if you're interested to learn more about uh, any future programs after this, head on over to chicagobirder.org, where our actually next two episodes are already posted and available to sign up. Um, including a program about uh, uh, one of our field museum research, local field museum researchers, researchers and his work on penguins, and uh, as well as a highlight of the bird rescue and rehab that happens in Chicago land. So hop on over there, check that out. And I think without further ado, I probably should have introduced myself. Hi, my name is Edward. I am president of the Chicago Ornithological Society. I'll be kind of your host, MC, and tech guy in the background here. But that said, I think I'm going to go ahead and pass it over to Bob Dolgan. Bob, take it away. Hey, thanks so much, Edward. I really appreciate it. And uh, thank you to COS for hosting this event. Um, I'm a huge fan, longtime member, former board member, and um, just applaud all of the many conservation and education efforts that COS makes. Um, so I don't want to um, go on too long before introducing the film, but uh, first I wanted to say a few thank yous. Um, thank you to everybody who supported this project. Um, you know, if, if you don't, if I, I'm, I'm not going to have time to share everybody's name, uh, but but you can see in the credits of the film, there's a long list. Hopefully, you'll spot your name in there. Um, and I want to thank the people who collaborated, uh, who helped me make the film. Our directors of photography. Mitchell Wankus and Mitchell Franson, uh, our music by Jake Vinsel and M. Pitanax, and our editor, Sharon Filkowski. I also want to thank uh, the people featured in the, in the film. They're really just uh, three of them, uh, Tyler Funk, Ron Bradley, and David Mott. Um, and just by way of introduction, a couple of thoughts. I mean, like, you know, why I decided to make this film after the Monty and Rose films. Um, I was thinking about, you know, new story ideas in uh, 2020 and I uh, came across this article. Um, I, I had a vague idea of what the magic stump was and some of the amazing sightings that had taken place there, but came across uh, an article written by Tyler that um, appeared in the Illinois Meadowlark uh, Journal and um, it, it just uh, blew me away. There's just a lot more to the story than I realized. Um, it went back a number of years. And, um, and there's just, just a lot of mystery as to why uh, the prairie falcons and so many other raptors have been congregating at the stump. And, um, and so um, I thought it might have the potential for a, a good film. Uh, I went down and visited with Tyler and um, he kindly showed me uh, out to the stump and, and spoke with me on camera and uh, it just took off from there. And um, I think it's turned into be a um, turned out to be a, a, a nice 20 minutes of, uh, of just a, a wonderful story that ho hopefully conveys the, uh, the joy of birding uh, more than anything else. Um, so I'm just going to flip over my screen and, um, and hit play, and then uh, I'll come back on screen and uh, we can do a Q&A and uh, hopefully hear your thoughts and questions too. So thank you very much.
virtual round of applause, everybody, for the magic stump. And it's kind of like at a theater, you know, do you oh, applaud this after the movie or not? I don't know, maybe people have different opinions on that, oh, but Michael, the filmmaker actually is here, so we definitely can give him an applause for that. Um, all right, so right off the bat here, I know many of you guys probably have a lot of questions uh, for Bob. So go ahead and start putting those in the chat box here. Um, I will do my best to find to keep track of them and call on you so you can go ahead and ask your question in person so it's not just me and my voice the entire time. Um, but I have a couple of just really quick questions to kind of get the conversation going here. Um, and I think honestly, at this point, a lot of folks who maybe know you, Bob, and know your previous works, I guess a big question, and you sort of touched on this at the very beginning, is just going from Monty and Rose and then the world of Monty and Rose you know, in some some ways, you could have done kind of anything, kind of gone in any different direction. You really kind of proved yourself as a bird, you know, filmmaker or conservation filmmaker. So what about this specifically really was like, this is it. This is what I'm going to do is my next story. There's something that I want to tell here. Um, I don't know, that's, a, that's a tough question, and, and but a great question. Um, I think, uh, you know, Monty and Rose is, is very much a story focused in Chicago on a really urban beach, uh, which was awesome and, uh, and amazing. I, I think uh, I've always been a big fan of driving out into rural kind of areas in Illinois in wintertime. And, um, you know, I, I sometimes you feel like you're the only person on the planet when you're out doing that and you're like one of the only people who gets up at you know six in the morning to go do something like that and i don't know i just had a personal um enjoyment of that sort of way of birding and and then i think um it really was reading i knew a bit about the stump um but reading that article and learning more about it i i think really opened my eyes to some things and there's something um kind of uh magical to me about where the stump is located there's uh, a map um, in that article that shows that um, it's really at the southern extent of the Wisconsin glaciation, which, um, you know, it was like, I, I'm a bit of a casual geology fan and was like, oh my gosh, now this explains so much more because it's not just a random, like the stump isn't just in a random part of Illinois, it's right at the end of the southern uh, end of the Wisconsin glaciation. And that, that just means that, oh, there might be something really ancient going on here um, in that the um, birds are coming back to this place because it's it has some significance going back centuries or, um, you know, maybe there's something going on with the topography there now that that's encouraging that location to be this hotspot. And that, that just uh, really, um, you know, caught caught my captured my imagination, and um, but yeah, it's hard to hard to decide because one could go in any number of directions. With there's so many potential birding stories, um, but I think this felt um, uh, distinct enough in some ways from Monty and Rose without being altogether different. Hopefully, like some of the aspects of storytelling and the kind of um, the sort of um, you know symbiotic relationship of sorts. Uh, Maybe maybe uh, more uh, one-sided on the human side with the prairie falcons, but um, but the sort of relationship between people and birds, and and that hopefully that would come across again. Um, so, but this was just a, it was just a very different setting, which got kind of got my creative juices going too. Yeah, for sure, <laughs> definitely a lot of elements at play here that I mean certainly make it intriguing. Um, you know, again, kind of, I guess, comparing to your previous effort going into this, were there any elements of this where there were maybe some unique challenges or kind of different approaches you had to take that you didn't expect? How did it compare filming this to your previous efforts and kind of what made it its own, you know, journey? Yeah, it's, um, probably the biggest challenge was just filming raptors. Um, I'd never really like gone out and deliberately tried to do anything more than like get sort of a roadside shot of a red-tailed hawk and um you know it, it um you know finding the prairie falcon on the visits i made there was challenging um it's covering a vast area and you know as tyler mentions in the film it blends in perfectly with uh with the farm fields there when it's when it's perched so um so i think that that was challenging but we you know had the benefit of this the amazing trail camera footage um that 
Tyler provided. And also, um, you know, we're able to piece enough together of other stuff. We got other species uh, in there, like you can see the Lapland long spurs, and then um, supplemented where we could with some archival footage where we needed to kind of just, you know, uh, connect things together. Um, and also Ron, uh, I should say, provided a, a number of beautiful still photos too that that helped fill things in. So um, yeah, I think it's just uh, also just greater awareness of raptors. I, I again, haven't, haven't really, really deliberately get set out to look at them that much before, even though they're super cool. And you, you know, you sort of realize that there, there are a lot of things that are very different about say falcons than and like plovers, plovers, <laughs> you know, shorebirds, completely different, um, you know, family of birds, um, you know, and uh, certainly in the ways of filming them, it, that was totally different. Um, but uh, but yeah, I, I you know, it was kind of interesting to see uh, raptors take a little closer look at them because there's just a lot to them too, and and there's actually. Some there's some connections with plovers in terms of like the migration story, like you know, and we can get into that. But where the prairie falcons are coming from might be like about a thousand miles away, it's about about the same same distance as the plovers to um, you know to their wintering ground. So anyway, um, but maybe I'll pause there and we can go to the next one. Yeah, um, I think I'll go ahead and turn it over to our audience here. Okay. Um, Regina McNulty. Would you like to unmute and ask your question? It's a pretty great question. Hi there. First of all, awesome, awesome presentation. Um, just curious as to where the stump is and if the falcons are still coming. Yeah, um, so it's uh, about three hours south of Chicago, uh, right off I-57. Um, I'd say Arcola, it's sort of between Arcola and Charleston, Illinois. Um, and yeah, about, I think about almost exactly like 180 miles south of Chicago. Um, and it is, it's in a, a farm field that's um, uh, in the northern part of Coles County. Um, it's, it's the only, uh, only standing sort of tree or stump of any kind, I think, in that whole square mile. Um, it's just a pretty amazing place. We can also get into some of the, uh, you know, secret little uh, geology things going on there too with the moraines in the area. Um, but um, yes, so um, <laughs> timely question. So Ron has just reported um, the prairie falcon back, uh, one prairie falcon back at the stump or the area around the stump just this week, um, which is uh, I think about expected for sort of late October. Um, but uh, so that the, the, at least the one prairie falcon and um, and I think it's been two, there, there have been two prairie falcons as recent, as maybe 2020, I think it was. Um, so, um, but, but yeah, they're, they're uh, on, uh, mostly there's been uh, a prairie falcon in the area for quite some time now. And, um, you know, and whether those are exactly all the same birds, um, it's sort of impossible to know. Great, thank you. I got another one from Andrew Reeves. Would you like to unmute yourself and go ahead and ask your question? Okay, I just wanted to know how many species of uh, raptors have been identified there. It sounds like a lot, but I just wanted to know the breadth of the number of species visiting there. Yeah, um, well, I, Tyler, if you're still still on, I might call on you for that to confirm. <laughs> um, but I'll, I'll, I think it's it's uh, about a dozen. Um, in the film, we show. Uh, uh, all of the falcon species, um, jeer falcon, mer merlin, prairie falcon, peregrine falcon, um, and and then you also see the snowy owl, the short-eared owl, rough-legged hawk, uh, dark morph is, is shown in the film, um, and and I know also I believe gold, golden eagle and bald eagle have been seen on, on that square mile, I'm guessing, you know, oh, red-tailed hawk is also in the film, I think uh, I would have to think a great horned owl would be in that area. I, I, I know a Cooper's hawk was in that area uh, when I was there once. So um, I don't know, Tyler, do you, uh, what am I missing there? And did I get my number right? I think you've ticked them all off. You picked <laughs> up the uh, great horned owl, which is right. Uh, about the only thing I can think of that you did not mention would be like the red shouldered hawk. Um, neat thing about the red tails, you know, you just, you get a lot of the, uh, northern species there and um, you know I don't but those are kind of subspecies and stuff like that but yeah you you I think you covered them all pretty well there 
All right, thanks. <laughs> Thank you for that answer. Sure. We got another question from Lynn Johnston. You want to unmute and ask your question? Sure. Um, hey, Bob, great job. And, and Tyler, fantastic. Um, I got partially the answer already, but I just wondered what the estimated lifespan is um, in the wild, if we know of a prairie falcon. Uh, so I think about uh, like 10 years is kind of on the higher end of uh, their life um, average lifespan. Um, so um, which starts you kind of you know, wondering and thinking about the birds here and, and how, um, you know, how long lived uh, that they are or maybe, or if these are the same birds over all these years or, or bird. Um, so, um, but the fact that there's a prairie falcon uh, there right now is is really exciting. Um, and and uh, it just uh, just adds to the, to the legend. <laughs> yeah, I'll say that's great. Thank you. <laughs> And the first one, you know, going to 2010, so we're in year 12 at, okay, at yeah. this point, which is pretty amazing to me. Um, and uh, I don't, I don't know. Like Bob said, it's it'd be speculative whether or not it's the same bird or not. But at the same time, when you read a lot about the uh, the habits of the prairie falcon going to Steinhoff and some of the different uh, research that was done, particularly out of the Snake River area of, of Idaho, um, prairie falcons have a a pretty high affinity for the same wintering grounds every year. So uh, that's what makes me feel like at least for a large period of time, these uh, are the, are, is one of the, one of the falcons is probably a, the same falcon, but we've also, like Bob said, just two years ago, we had uh, two falcons there again. And previously it had been since 2015 or 16, since there were two at the stump. So I do think that there's some some that just kind of cruise through the area, um, but I kind of wonder about the one that sticks around there all the time if it's not one that's continuing to use that as a winter ground. Fascinating. Thanks, Tyler. Related question uh, from Liz, uh, just Liz. Uh, if you'd like to unmute yourself, I think this is a very relevant question here too. Well, thank you for this video. It was really good. I learned a lot. Um, I never heard of or saw a harrier of a harrier before, so that was neat to learn about it. Um, but I was wondering, uh, does the prairie falcon breed somewhere else, and where is their usual habitat? Thank you. Yeah, so um, the prairie falcon is uh, a bird of the Rocky Mountains uh, in uh, the U.S. and uh, sort of southern Canada. Um, the, the type of habitat it uses, like at least in Idaho, is sagebrush steppe, um, which is, uh, I think it's more of a desert even than a grassland. Um, so, uh, but they're uh, generally moving from uh, their breeding grounds kind of in the Rockies, uh, sort of north and, and east uh, in their migration, uh, you know, in their migration pattern, and then they, they kind of come down to, to the south and like, so like, Places like um, Kansas would be sort of where one might typically imagine the nearest prairie falcons being, but you get some reports from like, you know, Minnesota and Western Iowa and places like that uh, frequently too. But um, um, yeah, so that that's, uh, was there anything more to that question? Or is that it? No, nope, that was it. Thank All you. Right, thank you. Yeah, let's see. Amy Morton, you're still here. You got a great question. Would you like to unmute and ask your question? Sure. Um, mostly my question was about the behavior of the birds at the stump towards the camera. It seems like they're doing a lot of facing of the field camera. Is that something that's normal or, and, uh, or is that kind of unusual? Um, I, I don't know. I'm curious to hear what Tyler thinks on this, but I, I think it was more coincidental. I know like I have a trail camera I occasionally put up in my woods and I know at night, like the raccoons will see like a, see some reflection there and they'll kind of run at it. I, but I, I don't know if I don't, at least the, the video I saw did not, I did not see where they, they were like really reacting to the camera. I think it was more, maybe we chose 
or Tyler helped choose going back way back when, like videos that that where they were looking at the camera because that, that was you got a good you know a good look at them. I think it might have been coincidental, but that's just my my guess. Yeah, that, that's pretty spot on as far as which one I selected to send to you, and you know that. I literally have combed through probably 5,000 uh, trail cam uh, videos, you know, and so they're they're facing a lot of different directions. The only placement uh, consideration for the camera was basically to put the sun at the camera's back and and provide the best lighting. So, um, yeah, that's probably about all on that. OK, that's interesting. Thanks. Got another interesting one from Michael Graff. Would you like to unmute and ask your question? Sure. Hi. Hi, everyone. Um, it was a lot of fun watching the film, having uh, been uh, down in Coles County and successfully managing to find the Falcon one time. It was really fun. Thank you. Um, my question is, uh, bird watching in Berrien County, that's southwest uh, Michigan, Western Michigan. Um, on some farmers' cornfields in winters, we've noticed an abundance of you know, different species. And I and I wonder if that sort of thing is common, that they're attracted to very specific fields because these cornfields uh, that where we've seen you know, long spurs and other birds, uh, they seem identical to fields where we consistently see nothing. Yeah, I don't. I don't know of any uh, studies that have specifically looked at that, but um, I, you know, I, I, I kind of had some curiosity in that area, and I kind of looked into things like whether there were, you know, these uh, cover crops, which are like wintertime crops of like you know certain grains that are that are grown, like if that would or wouldn't attract um, more. Um, really, it's dependent on whether there are rodents and. Uh, you know, uh, and, and birds and insects available in the fields for for the falcons to prey upon. Um, I, I personally couldn't really figure like find anything very definitive, and um, you know, I kind of asked some general questions to researchers, and um, one person uh, with the Coles County uh, Soil and Water Conservation District about that, and it was you know, um, it, it was sort of. Uh, there was there wasn't anything. I never really got anything too definitive, other than that there are. And I think I've talked to Tyler about this. Other than that there are a surprising number of critters in what can look like barren fields, um, and they're they're obviously these birds are finding what they need. So, but I don't know why it would vary field to field if that could be have something to do with the crops being grown or the location of the field. Like with the stump, it is on a, a bit of a ridge, very almost hard to perceive ridge that's just barely um a little higher than the surrounding area maybe that has that's a factor because it, it has offers such a wide view of um of the county there but um yeah i never could i it's a great question um but i i never could find anything personally i couldn't find anything definitive on that i don't know if other people have have a, other experiences I'll just point out, uh, condensing questions here, that there's been a couple of yeah. questions in the chat just about geography, right? Somebody was asking about, you know, what that waterway way is that is in your film and clearly nearby, and just other kind of topography that might factor in. Uh, yeah, so I think um, Tyler in his article um, really clearly provides some of that information and that so sort of the stump is between two river valleys, the Kaskaskia and the Umbra or Ambar. I, I, I know it's, I always get that, that word wrong. It looks like it says Embarrass River, um, if you see it on the map, but it's uh, Ambra, I think uh, would be about right. Um, but on the Ambra side, that's on the eastern side, and that goes down uh, through the county into a much hillier area. I had a chance to actually camp for two nights in Fox Ridge State Park, which is in that more hillier uh, hilly side of, of the county. And that's a, those are wooded steep hills, kind of has much, to me, it had much more of like a Southern Illinois feel to it. Um, and uh, and so yeah, though, that's just not gonna be a place where prairie falcons are gonna, are gonna be. They're not gonna be like in these these sort of oak hickory woodlands. <laughs> um, they're birds of op the op open spaces of, of the plains of grasslands. So um, yeah, so I think that that's sort of, to me, where kind of the topography 
comes in and it's really to me it was more like a habitat difference and that you know, you're going to find the harriers and short-eared owls and prairie falcons out in those grasslands but in the woodlands you know that's going to be your your great horned owls and um i imagine some you know red tails hawk, red tailed hawks sort of on the edges and uh and and your kind of cooper's hawks and, and so forth so um that's probably where I, I would see the topography coming in but really that it's amazing how different the train is in one half of the county versus the other. And I think just one thing that, so a lot of the article that I wrote kind of dealt with like this mystery of this fire and ice and how much the glaciation uh, and probably early prairie fires and things like that played a part into creating the, the soils and richness of of the soils in that area that provides so much of the biomass that's available for for these birds at a at a root level and the thing that was uh, I, I believe Bob spoke to it earlier is you know the this is kind of almost like a landing strip also for the northern migrating uh, American golden plovers and uh, certainly a wintering ground for the long spurs and things like that and so you feel like you know, I called it magic in, in my article, but there's something about that particular area where you have such a high concentration of plovers compared to anywhere else in the state. And I think that kind of goes up through Douglas County and even over to just the western side of Champaign and stuff. So it, it is, it is a, an air, there's a little bit of a dark side as far as, you know, man's uh, conversion uh, of this that provides opportunities, obviously, for prairie falcons these days with the you know barren landscape the way it is but um i do think that the glaciation and the prairie the, the prairie fires and stuff did put a, a a nice um a nice substrate of uh, that uh, creates a nice biomass for the food they need This is an interesting one, kind of a million dollar question of sorts. Rebecca Severson, do you want to unmute and ask your question? Oh, hi. Um, yeah, I, I think the article said that it's an Osage orange uh, stump, which uh, I grew up on a farm, so I'm familiar with those. But I was just wondering if anybody knows why the farmer or someone would have torn out that whole a whole row of Osage orange and left that one, because usually they were grown as hedges, I think, if I'm right. So I was just curious about, you know, maybe it was a property marker way back when, you know? So that's my question. I don't, Tyler, do you know the exact answer to that? I don't, but I do recall you sharing a, um, a historic map of that area. So clear back into, wasn't it around the 1930s or 40s, there was that particular tree that stood alone in that field. So. Uh, it is unusual for those to be uh, not in a hedgerow as you speak, uh, but perhaps it was just a, uh, a property marker. Yeah, I, I kind of had the impression that, um, well, I think it's right in the center of that square mile or country mile there. And um, it did seem like, if I recall correctly, and maybe I was just imagining this, it did seem like the soybeans were grown up to one side of it and maybe the corn was on the other side or you know like that it was still being utilized how like practically necessary that stump is i i'm not sure I, but um but yeah i think so i think there are a lot of the hedgerows uh have been removed in um in that area and um and that you know um gives me concern because it's like I, and i understand why it's, it's like helps um you know um grow more crops which are um are are you know that's a, a huge part of someone's income there and uh hopefully profitable um but for you know those hedgerows are important for for wildlife um and i i would probably i think raptors maybe even in particular so i um yeah so i um but thankfully the stump is still there um, and there are still hedgerows around there. Uh, it, um, you know, but definitely that square mile, that, that's about it. Okay, thank you. Great film. All right, so I got one more um, 
Uh, I think we're going to take one more audience question. And again, I think this is a good one that a lot of us are probably wondering here. Uh, Sandra Urban, would you like to unmute and ask your question? Well, if not, I'll go ahead and ask it because I think it's a good one to kind of start wrapping things up on here, which is just when is the best time to go try to see these prairie falcons? Uh, definitely, a, uh, you know, late fall to winter time uh, uh, visit would be recommended. So, I mean, it, they're, they're just arriving uh, or one has just arrived now. Um, you're, you're talking like now through about February. Um, and I think their departure dates have varied a little bit through the years, but, um, you know, or at least the date last cited has varied uh, a little bit through the years. And um, so definitely this is a, a wintertime experience. Um, and uh, it, it, it ha I happened to drive through that area in September and it looked very different. <laughs> uh, in September, very, very lush, a lot, a lot of vegetation uh, and a lot of corn. Um, versus the way it the way it does now, like you can barely make out the stump. So um, it's definitely a winter time, uh, a, a great winter trip. And I'll, I'll put in a plug in that um, I'm co-hosting a trip with um, Red Hill Birding, December second through December fourth. Josh Engel will be there as well. Um, I think Tyler has it on his calendar, um, and we'll be visiting the stump area and, and other area hotspots that weekend. And we'll, we'll also do another showing. Uh, of the film on the evening of the second. So check it out at redhillbirding.com. All right, I think I'm gonna wrap up with one last question, which is just, what is next for you, Bob? What's what what's now? You've you've capped off and oh, yeah, another film feather to your cap, what's next? Yeah. Um, so uh, it's another film kind of set in a somewhat similar area. Um, so I've been working on uh, a story about floodles, which are the watery areas that appear uh, temporarily all across the state uh, in Illinois. And um, and so a, a lot of these, uh, a lot of where floodle sort of maintenance and expansion is happening uh, takes place in agricultural fields. And there's a, a whole movement afoot to uh, restore floodles. And um, I had a chance to visit some amazing uh, amazing floodles in central Illinois in July. I just was blown away by the amount of wildlife. Many of these, many of the ones I was visiting were on private land. And, um, and so, um, yeah, so I'm still working on uh, filming that, but um, hope to have something, um, a, a longer clip or trailer to share soon. And um, hopefully I'll just be the next in this sort of series uh, about Illinois. And, um, but also interested in other stories would love to get back here into the city and um, feature all that we have. There's so much here to explore. So um, yeah, so thank you for asking. All right. Well, on that note, I know there are some other questions, uh, but we do want to kind of go ahead and wrap things up here for the evening. So once again, a big, big thank you to Bob Dolgan for uh, all the work he's done in this, sharing his film with us this evening and sharing his time and knowledge with us huge huge thank you really appreciate it um and thank you to you guys the audience for being here this night this evening and sharing this experience with us thank you for being here thank you for tuning in um hopefully you enjoyed it and if you did enjoy it once again uh feel free to hop over to our website at chicagobirder.org uh, you can view our whole listing of new websites. I'll go ahead and drop a link in the chat there um, of events, virtual events like this one, bird walks uh, coming up through the rest of the year. Additionally, I'll go ahead and also put another link in the chat as well. It's uh, Bob's website, The Magic Stump. You can learn a little bit more um, about this film, future screenings. Maybe you can get a chance to go see it in person. Um, which I imagine is a slightly different experience than what we had here this evening, um, as well as learn more about Bob's work as well. Uh, yeah, Bob, sure do you have any that, other places? No, it's very, very cold. Everything, the, the filming of this film was, uh, <laughs> was in frigid conditions. Um, no, I, I just thank you very, very much. And yeah, um, list of screenings. We have t-shirts and um, all sorts of information about the project uh, at that website. And we'll be following up everybody with an email, uh, including a link to, to the recording to this, is, to this discussion once that's live, as well as some resources that were talked about today. But with that said, have a great evening, everybody. Thanks once again for joining us, and uh, we will see you on the next one.